is no nobility in poverty. I have been a rich man, and I have been a poor man, and I choose rich every fucking time. Because at least as a rich man, when I have to face my problems, I show up in the back of a limo wearing a $2,000 suit and a $40,000 gold fucking watch. I just fell in love with this character. I really wanted to do this movie, and I couldn't get Scorsese out of my mind because he's able to bring out a life in these characters, a reality, and a sense of humor to that dark side, which very, very few filmmakers can accomplish. $22 million in three fucking hours! <laughs> Marty has a way of exposing the ugliness of criminal life in a kind of almost enticing kind of way. I wait all week for the fucking equalizer, and they have to fucking... Hello? Human beings, even in their most ludicrous types of behavior, are funny. Marty's a brilliant filmmaker. He can point the finger at somebody and show how foolish they are for their excess. You look at these guys and think, this seems to be a lot of fun. Well, it doesn't just look that way. They really did have a lot of fun. In fact, that's really all they could do is have fun and more fun and more on top of that until it wasn't so much fun anymore. So the challenge is to show that honestly, without tipping the scales into judgment. This was one man's account of a very uh, insane time in recent history. And what was so refreshing was his absolute candid honesty about every radical endeavor that he went through. Whenever you're presented with an opportunity to do a movie, you look for that kind of honesty in a lead character and a storyline. Jordan started out, he was a you know, regular kid, grew up in Queens, his parents were accountants. Wanted to make good, wanted to make a lot of money, wanted to be successful like we all do, and just fell down the rabbit hole. I think he really thought that he could bypass morality or surpass morality with a combination of money and drugs. This is a guy who lived like a rock star. He had everything everyone has ever wanted, and it wasn't enough. He still wanted more. It's set in Wall Street, but it's only the backdrop to one man's journey from, you know, from nothing to everything and then back to nothing again. Terry Winter wrote this screenplay that encapsulated all the most insane bits of Jordan Belfort's life and, in a way, really stylistically wrote it for Martin Scorsese. Marty's drawn to telling stories about flawed and broken people, and Jordan is certainly that. The story is told in that classic Scorsese staccato pacing. I love Marty. I've grown up watching his movies. You're drawn in by the spectacle and the excitement and how kinetic the filmmaking is and the violence and the, and the extreme characters and the humor. But also the moral aspects of his stories were wonderful. What are you going to do, spend the rest of your life in jail? Is that what you want? No, no. OK. No, 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 no. OK, you got all the money in the world. You need everybody else's money? Terry Winter's script had so much humor in it. And in a lot of ways, I remember Marty telling me about Goodfellas being, you know, almost uh, a dark comedy. And this lent itself to that, you know, that style of filmmaking. Marty's so good at doing the most dramatic version of events and making it believable and real. He can take something off of a page turn it into a visual storytelling masterpiece, and just the energy of it is just so incredible. And it's like a tsunami of craziness. We got plans up here that's going to take this company into the fucking stratosphere! You piss up the SEC's leg, you end up with your tits in a ringer. There's only two types of movies you can make or two types of stories to tell. There's the aspirational story, which is do this. Or there's the cautionary movie, which is don't do this. And, you know, Marty really has done both, but the don't do this moments in his movies are really memorable. I had to have total freedom with the cast and crew to do what I needed to do, which meant we all decided that we were going to go all the way with it as much as we could. He's obviously attracted to extreme characters. He's done films where they're murderers and villains, and but you kind of grow to love them. It's very strange designing clothes for characters who you actually have no empathy for at all. Knowing that Marty is the director that he is, he's going to bring something different to it. That's always the, the big question that you have going into a movie, whether audiences will be responsive to people committing atrocious acts. That was one of the things that uh, Marty said very early on. You know, through my experiences in making movies, 
if you're authentic with the characters and who they are and don't betray that, people will go along with anything. It's always fascinating about the betrayal of trust in a story. You finally found a broker on Wall Street that you can trust and who can consistently make you money. Sound fair enough? And so there's that element that's always been in my movies that deals with these characters that uh, break that trust. And right here, going in, they're pretending there's trust. <laughs> going in, they've broken it already. It's a very exciting role for Leo. From an audience perspective, you want to love him, but you, you kind of hate him too. And the movie it doesn't make a judgment, it doesn't apologize, it doesn't explain, it just presents the information for you to sort of draw your own conclusions. One of the references that I had was the film Caligula. It was a massive orgy of wealth and drugs and a group of people that really wanted to succeed at any cost. Our attitude was simply, let's really pull no punches. Let's not try to whitewash anything. Let's not try to make these characters quote unquote likable. Let's portray them for what they are. And that means also exploring the unbelievable time that they did have during those few years where they were completely unregulated and had no rules. For Leo and I and the other guys to play these people, we had to understand that this behavior is okay within these characters, even though we disagree with it. To play this person, you have to justify that you're okay with yourself doing these things. And then you get home and you're like, oh my god, like what did I do? You find all these reasons and make up your backstory and you justify it to yourself so that you can really commit to the decisions you're making in the script and not feel false about it. You're a father now, Jordan. Yeah. You're a father now. I know. And you're still acting I like an infant. And those actors had to have a reckless abandon. And uh, just as, as Marty doesn't judge the characters in any given moment, the actors can't either. We are With Marty, the energy was almost like a gigantic party on set all the time. Everyone bring something fun to the table, bring something interesting. Let's all give each other something to react to. For me, it was one of the most enjoyable film experiences I've ever had, and I think Marty will say the same. In the five films that I've worked with him, I've never seen him having this good of a time and being as open and free to try whatever came up. Marty creates a great atmosphere on the set. He's open to suggestions. He likes people to improvise if they can. And there's no more fun for an actor than to be able to do that. Marty's way of creating this in a collaborative atmosphere for his actors to kind of prosper. And for us as producers, it gives us nothing but pleasure to see people who are working hard, but at the same time getting a lot of pleasure and getting fun out of the whole process. I'm gonna teach each and every one of you to be Captain fucking Ahab. Captain who? From the fucking book, you From the book, motherfucker, from the book. Our approach was to be very improvisational. I've never been a fan of the bush, to be honest. Really? Yeah. I don't mind it. I think all of us wanted to connect with our characters. And then there was a massive rehearsal period. There was a lot of improvisation there. And we just kind of integrated all that rehearsal into the filmmaking process. What the is EJ Entertainment? <laughs> well, that's, uh... We had reference points of where we wanted scenes to go, but it was incredibly loose. There would be a lot of sequences that were only a page long, and we'd be improvising for hours and hours, and when you have the great actors that I got to act alongside, anything can happen on that day, and a lot of times it did. Leo's great. I mean, he's amazing to work with. Just go in any direction, and he'll just be right there and it pushes me to do more and take more risks. Enough of this shit will make you invincible. Leo's a daring guy. You could tell that he's worked with Marty before. They have a partnership. They have a wonderful shorthand and it's wonderful to watch them work together. FBI! When you get a direction from Martin Scorsese, you're part of his vision. With that said, there's also the allowance now to go do what you do. I have offered our lovely sales assistant, Danielle Harrison here. $10,000 to shave a fucking head! Every day we were on set, this scene would take multiple different directions. He'd say one little riff, one little bit of improv, and all of us would react to that, and we'd have to steer back to what the scene was ultimately about, then we'd go off into another tangent. You show me a pay stuff for $72,000 on it, I quit my job right now and I work for you. Jonah was just an electrifying force that ignited each scene every single day, and I'm very thankful that he did that for us. Yeah, my money tape, he did. Okay, technically, you do work for me.
Jonas really adds a perfect dynamic that you don't see on paper when you read the script. What are these sides? They cure cancer? That's the problem there. That's why they were expensive. Shut the fuck up. I'm serious. I know. Stop. He's so witty and clever, and he just comes out with these lines said with a complete deadpan sort of face. And so many times we just crack up. Because I'm just like, I don't know how he comes up with this stuff. It's, it's hilarious. You know, we kid was retarded. I would, I would, you know, drive it up to the country and just like, you know, open the door and let us say, you're free now. You know, like run free. Jordan Belfort. Yeah, yes, sir. Mark Hanna. Oh, pleasure. Matthew came in with a very specific idea for this character. Two, one, let's fuck! He went into this monologue that was so incredibly rich and colorful and insane and really introduces the entire audience to the world of Wall Street at that time. Dudski. No, no, thank you, though. <laughs> and encapsulates all the insanity in, in one unbelievable monologue. Name of the game, move the money from your client's pocket into your pocket. But if you can make the client's money at the same time, it's advantageous to everyone, correct? <laughs> no. He used the reference points that were in the script, but ultimately all the color and all the flavor is all him. But nobody knows if the stock is going to go up, down, sideways, or in fucking circles, least of all stockbrokers. He was on set, sort of beating his chest. Mm -hmm. And I sort of looked at Marty, and I was like, do you see what's going on here? And they integrated that into the scene, and that became the sort of chant of Wolf of Wall Street. That was only the second week of shooting, so that opened the movie for us in a way that we were able to just uh, not have any limits as to what would be deemed um, absurd. It's all absurd. Jean Dujardin was another actor that infused us with incredible energy. This was a role where he had to speak English a lot, but his ability to improvise in English really astounded us. Yeah, I don't understand, I'm sorry. <laughs> Anything that Marty wanted to throw at him or I wanted to throw at him, he would react to. The only way the Banque Real de Genève would cooperate with a foreign legal party is if the crime being pursued is also a crime in Switzerland. From a financial standpoint, you are now in heaven. He has a great sense of humor also. And it transcends the language. So he was able to pick out things in our dialogue and go with them and make it really enjoyable. Not cry, no, not really like cry. <laughs> Aren't you married? Well, yeah, but what? Married people can't have friends? We're not gonna be friends. Margot Robbie gave as well as she took on this holding her own. Mommy is just so sick and tired of wearing panties. She worked diligently on creating that character, and for her, a lot of the stuff was reactive. When I first read the script, my initial thought was, oh, it would be an amazing role, but my god, I could never get naked. And now it's just like, well, close off, because the far crazier things are happening. Everyone's so committed to making the best movie possible that everyone just goes further and further with it, and everyone's just there with you. You go out on a limb, and everyone's just going out on a limb as well. And Marty just lets you improvise for five minutes, do whatever you feel like doing. I don't love you anymore, Jordan! You, you, don't, you don't love me? The last scene that Naomi's in, we completely made up the night before shooting it, and it went from being a conversation to kidnapping and drugs and punching each other and smashing windows. It just went in a whole different direction. Throughout the film, with all the chaos and all the decadence, the money and the cheating and the stealing and the humor. There's gotta be one good guy in this whole damn thing. His name is Denim. He's an agent with the New York office. Don't you understand? He's smart, you're dumb. Kyle Chandler's character is incredibly important. Through our conversations, we created the scene on a boat, which to me is a very integral part of the movie. Ever been on one of these before? A boat? Learned how to sail when I was six. That was all done through his improvisation as well, and that led to this incredible scene that I think is one of the most important ones in the entire movie. You go after real criminals, which makes me wonder what, what the hell you're investigating me for. <laughs> First day on the boat, I haven't even met DiCaprio. If I'm not mistaken, no. you just tried to bribe a federal oh, officer. No, technically. Thankfully, Leonardo DiCaprio couldn't have made me feel more comfortable. And making your other actor feel more comfortable allows not only him to do his work, but allows you to do your work. And once you're in that realm, then you just play. Good for you, little man. Little man? <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> Me, the little man. They're going to need to send a fucking SWAT team, because I ain't going nowhere. 
why bother telling the story of somebody who's unremarkable? People say, well, that type of person, that sort. I guess what that means is that they try to distance themselves from them. It's someone else, it's not me. But in actuality, I feel it's not someone else, it's, it's us, it's you and me. And maybe if we had been born under different circumstances, maybe we would have wound up doing exactly the same things. It's a matter of facing and recognizing that part of us, which is a part of our common humanity. Stratton Oakmont is America. There is a vicarious thrill about watching criminals. There's something voyeuristic and fun about being a part of that lifestyle without the consequences. You can just sort of live it and go, wow, that was a fun life to view, but uh, I'm glad I'm not part of it. I don't think that movies are necessarily there to tell a moral tale. They're there to depict people as authentically as you can. To me, those are the films that I want to watch, the films that I think about. It's been a long journey to get this movie made, and I'm incredibly happy with the outcome. This was the culmination of a lot of different artists getting together with a very specific attitude. As a result, you have something that I think is incredibly loose, incredibly entertaining, very authentic what movies should ultimately be.